Hi everyone, I'm Avi Green. Thank you so much for joining us for the No Jargon Live Show. I, yeah, absolutely. We've made it through 99 episodes so far and I'm so glad that you're here for episode number 100. So I wanna give you just a couple of housekeeping announcements before we get started. And those are this, first of all, in the extremely unlikely event of an emergency, ushers will take you safely out of the theater. Secondly, uh, please do not um, record uh, or videotape or take pictures of this. Don't worry, we've got that handled. This is a live podcast, so it will be recorded, and it will also be available on video, thanks to, our, thanks to help from Cambridge Community Television. Beyond that also, please take a moment and silence any of those devices that you've got with you. Much, much appreciated. And with that, I have a couple of thank yous before I get started. I just want to thank uh, the Calderwood Theater for having us here. Uh, I want to thank you, our listeners and audience, for making this possible, and all of the members of the Scholar Strategy Network. Now let me tell you about tonight's show. I think it's going to be a good one. So we're gonna talk about America's divided politics, how we got into the mess that we're in, and where we're gonna go from here. One of the questions that I'm really interested in is this, this moment with Trump as our president and things being so fraught. Did it come down on us from above? Did it come because of President Trump himself or national organizations, national leaders and philanthropies and organizations making those decisions? Or did it bubble up from below, one state and one community at a time? To answer that question, we've got what I think will be three fantastic uh, sets of scholars to talk with us tonight. We're gonna start by talking about America as a whole. Then we'll look at the swing state of North Carolina, which is kind of the tip of the spear in terms of the most competitive and perhaps important polit political fights in the country. After a short intermission, we're going, to talk, um, we're going to talk about Massachusetts and ask whether this little blue island that we live in, uh, or that I live in, is actually so different from what is going on in the nation as a whole. And lastly, I think we're going to have an opportunity that will be super fun at the end, which will be a chance to ask your questions for those of you in the studio audience tonight. And for those questions, I just wanna point out that in your programs there's a little card where you can write those questions, and then during the intermission, you'll have a chance to pass them in. So with that, let's get started with the first act. So our first two uh, researchers tonight are Theda Scotchpole and Renee Flores. Fida is the director and one of the founders of the Scholar Strategy Network. She's edited over 600 policy briefs as part of that. She's also a professor at Harvard. She's the Victor S. Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology. And she's been studying what organized money um, does on the left and on the right and how that's changed our politics. We also have Renee Flores, who's a professor uh, who's an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Washington in Seattle. He's actually a visiting professor in, in Texas right now, and he's flown in from there to talk about anti-immigrant rhetoric. He's been traveling around the country studying it. I think it's a very important topic, especially given that the president just revoked DACA and issues about immigrants are in the news right now. So with that, please give a warm round of applause to Theda Scotchpole and Renee Flores. So, Theda, I want to jump right in with this question. The, the Koch brothers very famously did not endorse Donald Trump. So, did they have anything to do with getting him elected? <laughs> yes, they did, um, because we shouldn't think of the Koch brothers as a couple of individuals who write checks to presidential candidates. I think that's how a lot of us who study money and politics think about the issue. 
Uh, but the Koch brothers have been working for more than a decade with what are now 550 other wealthy conservatives uh, spread all over the United States to build up a massive political network or political machine that can influence policy debates and elections at, in, in three dozen states as well as in Congress and for the presidency. And so even though the Koch brothers themselves and some of their donors, but not all of their donors, didn't really like the Donald Trump choice when it finally emerged in the Republican primaries, the network itself had been investing for years and it amped up its investments to turn out voters in the crucial Senate contests in 2016. And at the same time, they turned out a lot of the voters who voted Donald Trump into office. We can talk about this later, but after he got into office, they simply moved in and staffed his administration. So, right, right. That, that's a question that I actually want to ask about, about Koch. So Trump, and I, and I want to come to Rene Flores in a second, but before that, um, Donald Trump very famously says he's not your typical Republican. He's going to protect Social Security. He's going to invest in infrastructure. He's for the little guy. Uh, so this is not a standard GOP, Koch brother kind of thing, right? Donald Trump can be understood as the sort of uh, apotheosis of two pincers that have hit the Republican Party and the whole US political system over the last uh, decade or so. Um, one of those pincers is from below. It is populist. I do think that the Tea Party people who revolted against Barack Obama in 2009 and 10 and 11 are loyal Trump supporters now, uh, with some more uh, uh, um, working class and middle class uh, people added to their ranks. Uh, and their top issue is immigration. We'll get to that soon with a real expert. But the other pincer in all of this, remaking the Republican Party, actually outflanking it and getting Republicans to support extreme measures that most Americans, even most Republicans, don't really want, like cutting Social Security and Medicare, getting rid of health care, uh, um, deregulating um, the economy, breaking unions. Uh, these are not populist policies, and they have managed to shape a lot of the actual administrative state under uh, Donald Trump. So, so it looks like in some ways uh, the Kochs and the standard GOP or even the far right of the GOP have tons of influence under, under Trump. And in that way, he's kind of um, a continuation of things that have been going on for at least the recent past in the Republican Party. But Rene Flores, I want to ask you about what Trump says and, and how he talks, especially about how he talks about race, because in some ways he's, he's kind of new about that. Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, Donald Trump essentially started his campaign when he came down from the you know, Trump Tower, when he rode those the elevators with his wife, by breaking an agreement that the Republican Party had about not talking too negatively about immigration. I mean, they were coming out of the 2012 defeat, they, they had an autopsy report where they essentially concluded that, that, that Romney had alienated the Hispanic vote. I mean, he famously said that how we deal with immigrants is by, by pushing them to self-deport, right? So that was his, his public policy in that regard. And they thought that, that you know, Karl Rove, he came out and said, you know, uh, if we do to Hispanics what we did to African Americans, there's no future for the Republican Party. We need to go beyond our white base and embrace Hispanics. And we do that by not alienating them when it comes to immigration. Trump comes down and he literally takes, he, he had read uh, this book by uh, Ann Coulter, Ann, Ann Coulter uh, The Oz America, where she essentially lays out uh, all these things that immigrants were doing. They're like, they're rapists, they're bringing germs and rare diseases, we're gonna mutate if you, you know, they move into our towns. And, and he just straight out to start saying that. He's like, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the, the speech who says, you know, immigrants, they're, um, they're not like you or you. They're criminals, they're rapists, they're bringing diseases, they're bringing drugs. And uh, the Republican elite was shocked because they thought we're gonna lose the election with this guy, right? And, um, but, but, but little did they know that that actually would resonate, I, I mean, this, this plain, uh, the identity politics card could resonate among some people. Now the big question is, is it having an effect? And, and I think there's a lot of anecdotes about the so-called Trump effect. Uh, you know, journalists have been talking about it. There's been more reports about, uh, uh, you know, at, uh, like attacks 
uh, like on, on, on you know, these hate groups coming up, attacking minorities like Jewish people, Muslims. We also have, of course, some episodes of violence here in Boston itself. Uh, a few weeks after Trump gave that famous speech, uh, uh, two, two, two men, two white men, there were two brothers, they were walking by, uh, around the t by the JFK subway station and they found a man that was sleeping um, and they thought he was undocumented. So they grabbed a metal pipe and started to beat him down. So when, um, when they were doing that, on top of that, they also urin urinated on him. So not only do we want to hurt you physically, we also want to humiliate you. We want to inflict some psychological pain. And as they were doing that, they were saying, Trump was right. We need to deport all illegal immigrants. The man, later on, he, he actually turned out to be um, a permanent resident. He was a 50-year-old man, and he, he wrote a letter where, during the trial, and he said, I'm a farmer. I've worked all my life to put food on people's tables, and, uh, but my fingers will never be the same. So, so this is just a little bit of an anecdote, uh, and, and I've conducted more research um, more systematically to see can we go beyond this sort of painful anecdotes and to see if there's a broad, more of a, you know, a widespread Trump effect. I guess we can talk about that a little, a little bit later if you want. Yeah, I, I, really, I really do want to talk about that, about to what extent Trump's, Trump's words really, really matter. Um, I, I want to ask you, I do want to ask you, before we go back to Theta, about the chicken and egg question, though, right? Are people... Uh, are, are there people who already are angry about racism and Trump is just saying or, or feeling uh, racial resentment, they feel worried about immigrants, they don't like immigrants, they don't like people of color, whatever, and, and Trump sort of in some ways sometimes taps into that, or is he in some way creating something? You did an experiment or you found a natural experiment to try to figure that out. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. The one thing about Trump is that, I mean, he might be a tragedy for some groups, but for social scientists, it's an actually a great opportunity, right? In a sense that... <laughs> right. may, maybe a disaster for the country, but a fantastic experiment. If you care about foreign policy and, you know, the, the, the fate of the planet, you might be worried, but for social scientists, it's a great time to be alive, you know? Uh, it's a good time to study American politics. Everybody's paying attention. I keep getting grants for immigration, yeah, right, so yeah. anyways, I, I shouldn't be making jokes about this. So the thing about, about Trump is that uh, nobody else was talking about immigration, right? So he came out with a very negative statement. It's almost like a natural experiment to know if politicians can indeed affect how people feel about particular targeted groups, in this case, Im immigrants themselves. So when, when Trump was giving his speech, during those days, Gallup happened to be on the field. Gallup, the survey company, they were essentially asking people a few days before and then during and after, how people feel about immigrants. So I was able to conduct this experiment, essentially, where I compared people uh, that, that were interviewed before Trump's speech and after, and I was, you know, these groups are very similar, so I was able to rule out all these, all these uh, differences. I'm trying to say this without using jargon, by the way. Right, you know, right. Like, doing Two similar groups. There's a red Sounds light good. that's going to go on, and we, have, we might be yeah, shocked they'll, they'll if you pull actually you up. Violate, you know, I'm like, you just see me in pain, that's why. Uh, so so, so what, what I find, essentially, is that it does have an, an effect. If you have this leader at the highest levels of political leadership saying, these people are rapists, they're, they're bringing disease, it, 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 people do have express much more negative uh, opinions, but here's a caveat. It only lasts for a little while. It only lasts for a few days. If you interview the same people, which I did, I did some follow-up experiments, the effect is gone. You can no longer see a, a so-called Trump effect. But the thing about it, though, is like, I think Trump is aware that when, when, he, uh, when he says those things, he, he, he gets people riled up, but it's only temporarily. He's been interviewed about this fact, you know, about his rallies, and he says, you know, if I'm in a rally, and if I, and I, and if I see people losing off, sort of like that man on the third row, like you're losing off a little bit, when, he, when they do that, what do I say? Who's going to build the wall? Who's going to pay for it? And then people come back to it, you know? So, so, so he, he mobilizes this, 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 this and, then, and people respond to that in a certain sense. But my take is that he's not actually changing internal beliefs. Attitudes tend to be pretty stable over time. What he's doing, though, is like mobilizing people. If you, know, you, you feel legitimated when somebody says, make those comments, to say, you know what, I actually don't like him either. I'm going to come out, I'm going to protest, or, or I'm going to express my, my dissatisfaction in other ways. Uh, the, the issue, though, is that he's going to be in office for the next three and a half years. So there's going to be this constant 
priming, this constant riling up of the population. Uh, Steve Bannon, just to finish, Steve Bannon, uh, they kind of know this, right? He said that uh, we, they were asked about if they're concerned about the low popularity that, that Trump has. They said, once we build the wall, that's going to come back up. We know that the wall is completely useless as a way to either stop uh, Mexican immigrants, because while they were, they're not coming. They stopped coming in 2008. But that's besides the point. They also won't stop drugs. Why? Because, you know, there's tunnels. But nonetheless, it's, it's a very powerful symbolic uh, uh, you know, tool that to stoke racial resentment, right? I mean, so, so that's why for them, I think it's going to be very useful. Yeah, and you know, I, th I think it's, your points are interesting. I would say that politics is about mobilization. It's not about things people privately feel. And I wonder if an experimental technique can tell us all we need to know about what it means to have a president of the United States in an authoritative position saying these kinds of things again and again and again. It seems to me that's different than a rally. And it could um, change what people hear in their environment from others over the long run. What do you have in mind? Well, I don't think it's very interesting to ask whether people are, as individuals, inherently racist or not. First of all, I think most people are a vast mixture of feelings and attitudes. They're not sure what they think about a lot of things, or they think contradictory things. But what gets publicly expressed, and uh, people feel that they have permission to publicly express, makes a huge difference in the way a society is organized in the politics. Professor so Scott, I'm well, not sure we're going to survive a, a Trump presidency without a serious exacerbation of racial divides in this country. So you're saying that the norms of what's allowed to be said are changing because of Trump. And those norms matter regardless of what people privately feel inside. Peter, can I, can I ask you a little bit about people on the ground? So you, you studied uh, Tea Party folks, this was a, a number of years ago, and recently you've been talking with folks in Indivisible and also just sort of plain voters in different parts of the country. Can you, can you tell me, are there similarities between, because for, for I think a lot of academics are, are progressives, they tend to align on the, the left, um, and it's easy to see, and perhaps it is the case, that what's going on now in the GOP is totally different. Um, but was the, is the mobilization that's happening for um, in, indivisible members now saying what's happening in the country is unacceptable and they need to change it, is it the same in some ways as what the Tea Party did five or six or eight years ago? Well, that's part of the question that um, I'm asking along with Vanessa Williamson and other people involved in uh, back at the beginning of the Obama presidency, it was for political scientists and sociologists an interesting moment because it was a president of one party promising to change the direction of the country backed by a Congress of the same party. That's a pretty rare alignment of the planets. It's not quite as rare as a total eclipse crossing the entire United States, but it's rare. Right. And so now um, we uh, have the same thing. We have a, a, chain, a president promising to change. It's a little unclear what he's promising or whether you could believe anything he promises, but um, he's promising change and he's backed by his own party. So it's in another kind of natural experiment in a way. What happens at the base of the opposing party when that occurs? Well, I can tell you based on visiting eight counties that have voted for Trump, where it turns out that in all those places there are indivisible or action together movements, overwhelmingly organized by women, um, that, um, it's not completely different from what Vanessa and I saw back in 2010 and 11 with the Tea Party conservatives. In both cases, outside the particular political party on their side of the spectrum, sometimes critical of that party from um, a combination of kind of the middle and the edges. Um, Self-organized, not nobody's telling them what to do, nobody's sending them checks. Um, um, and um, then the question is whether this will leap, and by the way, women often organizing both the Tea Party groups back then and uh, the indivisible groups now, even though women lean more liberal and democratic, uh, that's just because women do the work. Uh, it's just <laughs> the way it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, 
you know, I think the question is, and we don't know the answer yet, will this lead to voting? Because the Tea Party folks back then, their top issue was hatred of immigrants. They would have voted for Donald Trump, who came out as a birther during our interviews, if he had run. Remember, the Tea Partiers were looking for a non-Mitt Romney, and they looked through many options. If Donald had been there, they would have loved him then. Uh, so the question, though, is they didn't, even though they didn't like Mitt Romney, they didn't like the Republican Party, they turned out in big droves to vote for Romney and to vote for Republicans in the following midterm elections. What's not clear to me is these, if these indivisible groups, which are self-organized, are going to turn out and vote for Democrats um, in uh, 2017 and 18 and 2020. So related to that, I, I want to ask about a thing that the Tea Party definitely could not do uh, and that therefore Indivisible probably can't do. The, the Tea Party couldn't stop Barack Obama both from being reelected and they also couldn't stop him from being Barack Obama. You know, one of the things that the Tea Party didn't seem to like about Barack Obama was who he was. I think one of the things that Indivisible and many people don't like about Trump is who he is and what he says. Um, it looks like he's going to keep saying what he's saying. Um, what are your concerns about that? What what does anti-immigrant rhetoric really really do? I mean, I think uh, to follow up also with what Thea was saying, I think we need to to sort of put Trump into perspective, his political discourse. Uh, we know that using racial resentment to mobilize people politically is nothing new in our history, right? I mean, if you go back to the Jim Crow era, uh, there were politicians that were running saying, oh, we're going to lynch those black people, and they would get elected. I mean, that's how you could get elected in many places. Uh, in the South, you know, you, uh, somebody like Theodore Bilbo, he got elected into the Senate by making those premises. But the civil rights movement was supposed to have changed all of that. I mean, it, it was supposed to have had this, this institutional change and also this change in discourse where all of a sudden it wasn't cool it wasn't acceptable to be openly racist. To actually say, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take care of, of the black people and, and believe me, you're gonna need to vote for me. That wasn't supposed to be acceptable anymore. You know, that wasn't part of the acceptable political discourse. And uh, you know, in, in social science, political science, sociology, you know, we have uh, essentially, we analyze how people, but, but here's the thing, politicians kept, kept using race to mobilize people. I mean, that's very effective in US politics, right? But they, they, they couldn't do it explicitly anymore. So they had to use coded language. Instead of saying like, oh, I'm gonna take care of those black people on the other side of the street, they would say, I'm gonna be tough on crime. I'm gonna do you know, criminal justice reform. I'm gonna you know, put those immigrants back where they, you know, so it's, the, the idea was that if you were to actually be too explicit about race, that could backfire because, because they would violate the norm of equality. And that's where we, were, where we thought we were. All of a sudden, Trump comes and essentially completely challenges those ideas by being explicitly racial in nature, by say, saying things about Muslims, about women, about blacks, about Jews, about everybody, every, every single group. It's almost like he went down quite systematically, and yet he got elected. So social scientists, we have to do a lot of homework now. Where do we live now? Or is it, or is it that our old theories were not fully correct? I mean, did this alleged change in political discourse, was it just skin deep? Was it as widespread as we thought? Was it confined to just particular places? Those are the questions that we're asking right now. What we conclude essentially is that a lot of folks either are motivated by this racial discourse, or at least they're not bothered enough to, to, to vote for somebody else. Yeah, and you know, I want to stress that this is really, for me, not really a question of the mass of core voters for Donald Trump. I think they've been with us. I think they've had these um, resentments. I think they feel a new permission to act or right. speak on them. But they are a minority. They are not most Americans. Um, remember, Donald Trump didn't really get most Americans' votes. I think the issue is elites, starting with the leaders of the Republican Party. They are the ones in the crosshairs of history. They are the ones who have to decide are they going to go all the way with this? Are they going to allow, for example, suppression of minority voters in an overt way? 
coming into uh, future elections. So far, the jury is out. The Charlottesville ep episode did cause some people, even in Trump's own administration, to speak up and others to begin to break ranks. But for the most part, they've gone along like sheep in the hopes that they can get the next tax cut signed into law. Is it worth it to lose your soul for a tax cut for the rich? That's the question. Uh, and I think the jury is out, but I think it's an elite question. It's the leaders of our institutions, including our civic groups, that have to speak on these issues because it's we don't need to have America, you know, wagged by its tail by 25% of the population. They're right. not enough. What, what, so, I'm, what I'm concerned about I'm is actually, I'm going to stop you guys right there. There's plenty more to talk about, and we will during our Q&A. But just because of our time with our podcast, I'm going to ask everyone to please give a round of applause to Theda Scotchpole <laughs> and Renee Flores. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They were fantastic. So before we go, before we go further, I, I want to answer a question that I've received from many no jargon listeners since I'm always interviewing everyone else, which is, uh, who am I, and why are we doing this no jargon podcast at all? I will not tell you the entire life story. So let me simply uh, tell you one thing that connects me to, to North Carolina. I, I graduated college having studied ethics I was, a, a, and religion, and I was really interested in the past and whether or not uh, life in the past had, had involved fairness and truth and equality. Uh, and I was thinking about studying that and becoming a researcher for a lifetime. Well, before I in, engaged in what would have been a multi-year, multi multi-multi-multi-year PhD, uh, I instead decided to take a year to teach, and I went down to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which for me, coming from Philadelphia as a Jewish kid from the north and moving to a town where uh, both parts of the city's names were brands of cigarettes, it was, it was a pretty big shift. <laughs> and, and, and when I got down there, um, the, people were incredibly, the people were incredibly kind. The, the politics was incredibly, actually, similar in many ways to Pennsylvania. But there was something going on that was quite interesting. There was some politics that mattered. So this was back in 1996 when people were saying that politics was over, the Cold War was done, uh, there's no differences between the two parties. But as it turned out, in North Carolina that year, there was something interesting. So you had the incumbent US senator. His name was Jesse Helms, and he had been an, an arch conservative. In fact, he'd been an opponent of desegregation years before, uh, and had shifted with his party, but was certainly still a rock-ribbed conservative. And he was running for re-election against uh, a local new Democrat, a, a, a young guy with, with lots of ideas uh, named Harvey Gantt, who'd been the first black uh, student at Clemson University. So that had been probably pretty bold. And the first black mayor of, of Charlotte. So they were running. And I wanted to assign to my students, to why I was, was teaching down there, um, seventh grade world cultures. I wanted to assign to my kids to watch the, the debate because I had always thought that we should have a debate, a debate about ideas, about facts, about policy, in order to make intelligent decisions. So I went to the TV guide. And for those of you podcast listeners uh, who may not know, I was asked this by one of, our, uh, one of the people who work on the podcast, the TV guide is a, uh, a paper document <laughs> that was used, yes, that was used uh, in decades past to tell people what would happen on the like nine or so channels of television, because that's what they had available if they wanted to watch. Uh, so I looked in this thing, this, paper, this magazine, TV guide, to see when the debate was going to be between these candidates so I could assign it to my kids to watch it. And what I discovered was that there wasn't going to be one. And the reason that there wasn't going to be a debate was because Helm said, the people of North Carolina know me. They know me fine. 
And I don't need to give the free TV time to my opponent. And I was very, very mad. And, and I decided to do something about it. So I started collecting petition signatures. And again, as an update, uh, that was a physical thing that people would do with their actual <laughs> signatures. And I had friends, and first they collected um, dozens and then hundreds and finally thousands of signatures. And we went and we presented them uh, to Jesse Helms and we got nothing. And it was, it was very depressing. Um, and what I realized then was that the quality of the democracy that we're going to have is going to be no better than the worst possible democracy that we are willing to accept. So, realizing that, I, I realized I, I didn't have the time to worry about ethics in ancient life. I was really interested in ethics in, in modern life. And as I was trying to get people to care about this issue, the local North Carolina public radio station gave me a call and said, well, you know, we don't know how much of a news issue this is. We think it's interesting. Why don't you come in and talk about it on the air? And I did. And... In some ways, that was, that was the first No Jargon episode ever. <laughs> so with that, I still think that facts are super important, that people should have a chance to hear them, that journalists should be informed by them, so that we as citizens and voters can make intelligent decisions. And I also still think that North Carolina is incredibly important to our politics. And that's why I'm super glad to introduce to you the next two speakers. Deandra Rose is an assistant professor of political science and public policy at the Stanford School uh, of Public Policy at Duke. And her colleague, also at the Stanford School at Duke, uh, Gunther Peck, is an associate professor of history there. They'll give us an update on North Carolina. Please welcome them. Deandra, Gunther, I'm so glad you guys are here. So, quick history lesson for those of us who are not from North Carolina, not North Carolina specialists. Maybe, Deandra, you could start with the right. So, yes. what has been happening over the past few years with the GOP in, in North Carolina? So, in 2010, for the first time in more than a century, the Republicans won control of both houses in this, the state legislature. And as soon as they did, they didn't waste any time making really important changes that helped to consolidate their power. So they worked to change electoral maps in really important ways. They changed access to the polls in important ways. And North Carolina provides a really powerful example of how lawmakers can use institutions to basically entrench their own power. And Gunther Peck, what did the left do in, in response to this? I, I, I presume they just said, oh, OK. Um, well, uh, they got depressed. But mostly they, got, uh, they became angry. And, but I would say what uh, really did change the story was the passage of the voting rights, a, a, a law that was called Restore Confidence in Government, which was the Voter Disenfranchisement um, Act. <clears throat> And when that was passed, when that Can you just say a tiny bit about what it did that, make, that made right. it, in, in your view, a, a disenfranchisement act? Right. So it uh, restricted access. Uh, it, it, it cut back uh, dramatically on the number of hours of early voting. It created a photo ID. Only certain types of ID were accepted. Hunting license, fine. Medicare card, no. Um, student IDs, no. Definitely no. If you look at the majority that brought uh, Barack Obama, North Carolina's victory for in, Obama. In 2008. In 2008, it was one age group. It was the 18 to 29-year-olds who voted almost 80% for Obama. Uh, McCain won every other age group. So in fact, the law was targeted not only at poor people, African-Americans, transient people, but especially students. Um, and so if you voted outside of the correct precinct, your ballot was thrown into the trash. Um, 2014, I had several of my students vote, and their votes were not counted. Well-meaning poll workers uh, gave them provisional ballots, thinking they were legitimate ballots, and they were thrown out. Um, so that kind of chicanery, mischief, um, it's a different way of disfranchising. You're not even told. You're just being 
disfranchised. That led to a gra groundswell of mobilization, not only in the Triangle, but really across the state, sometimes known as the Moral Monday movement under the leadership of the NAAC president, uh, Reverend Barber. And uh, that began a more direct ca uh, campaign of civil disobedience to dramatize the issues. Um, I was arrested among, among one other th thousand other North Carolinians. So I, I want to yeah. ask more about that, but, but I, I also want to ask you, Deandra, to what extent is North Carolina politics abnormal, hmm. right? You know, all's fair in love and war, right? Yeah. So, and yet, there is this kind of thing that, that we have in politics, we're supposed to have in politics about having like a loyal majority. Yeah. If I win, I'm not supposed to change the rules so that you can never win. Yes. Um, and you had lived in many different parts of the country before you came to North Carolina. So if you could just, just tell me how different it is there. I mean, it seems, for me, I would describe it as a fever pitch. Mm. The fact that people are seeing this contemporary political landscape and are, are crying foul. And so I think part of it goes back to the history. So North Carolina has a really interesting progressive history. So a history of progressive governors like Terry Sanford, you know, for whom our policy school is named, um, Jim Hunt. And, and people who actually approached public policy and policy making from a very progressive perspective and used a scholarly um, approach to making policy. And I think that people are seeing that we're deviating from that in ways that are really troubling and they're blowing the whistle. And so we're starting to see the Moral Mondays, you know, in Durham, North Carolina, for example. I mean, imagine seeing days after what happened in Charlottesville we had crowds of people that met downtown and actually pulled down a Confederate statue. And so um, one of my favorite recent stories is after this happened, a number of the activists were arrested and then dozens of North Carolinians went down to the sheriff's department to actually uh, confess, to co-confess to this. And so you had this line of people actually protesting their arrest and saying, you know what, if they're guilty, we're all guilty, which I thought was interesting. Wow, yeah, I do. So part of this, Gunther, for you, I think for, for both of you, it's, it's not just that you're um, observers, it's not just that you're scholars, you're also citizens there. And Gunther, you have been an activist, you're also now a plaintiff. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So um, I'm a plaintiff in a case, we're suing uh, our fair state of North Carolina for um, on a charge of partisan gerrymandering uh, which is different from the racial gerrymandering that it's already been, uh, in effect, accused and found guilty of. And they've changed the districts. Uh, you mean they were accused, it went to federal court, uh -huh. they were found guilty, and they had to change the maps. They redrew them in such a way that it preserved the right. Not just statement. rhetorically accused and found guilty, but actually accused <laughs> and actually found guilty. And actually found guilty. Right. Yes. I just want to, so just want to be clear. Yeah. You're, you're, not, you're not using slogan. It's no, the no, real no. thing. No jargon. No jargon. Is right. Um, <laughs> law. And uh, so the current, I mean, to give you an example of what the problem is, in 2012, there were a majority of congressional ballots cast for Democratic candidates. And of the 13 seats in North Carolina, Democrats won four. Um, it's now a 10-3 split, even though the range is about the same. I think at the last election, Democrats got 48% of the vote, and they won three out of 13. So you have every Democrat winning about 75 to 80 percent, every Republican winning with a 10, part, 10 point or 12 point margin. And they've been carefully drawn. So the, ar the argument in this case is that in fact, not only is that unfair, but that my uh, capacity as a partisan has been compromised. My ability to, inf there is no election in play uh, for someone like me or the organizations that I've helped build and been partic participating in to actually change the outcome. You'd have to have a strange kind of contagion or flu or a, a wave election of unprecedented proportions to really knock out the Republican majority. So it, it's, uh, it's almost, it's almost a, uh, a gerrymander proof majority at this point. Right. In, in simple terms, yeah. uh, the game is rigged. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm glad you mentioned that. So uh, one of the most difficult moments in the last election when we were trying to get people to vote and this is how the gerrymandering, it has a, there's two problems with it. Obviously, it's unfair. Democrats did it, certainly, um, as well as Republicans. But it demoralizes people's faith in the system itself, in the institution of representative democracy. 
I was canvassing an African-American uh, veteran at the bus stop downtown. He was formerly incarcerated. He has voting rights because he had finished parole. And he was very interested in the fact that he could vote. And I was explaining this to him. And while I was doing this, a white citizen behind him started yelling at both of us, saying, um, it's all rigged. It's all rigged. And my response was, and not a good one, I should have said, you're right, it's rigged. That's why you should come in and vote and vote for you know, the Democratic team that's seeking to stop this gerrymandering. Instead, my, the voter I was talking to was upset, was visibly shaken by the yelling. I said, don't worry about him. He's just one Trump voter. That was a mistake, bad canvassing. Um, <laughs> because every citizen counts. You want, to get, you want to get everyone. You want to engage everybody. And this one fellow, uh, after, this, uh, after, the, after my uh, newly um, registered voter was driven to the polls, this fellow came over and started yelling at me in my face and tried to intimidate me. Um, and that was, that was, in some ways, my mistake. But I did learn something there as well. He was upset because I had outed him as a Trump voter. Mm -hmm. And I realized at that point that there was a hidden Trump vote um, in our state. Maybe I shouldn't have been so naive. But um, so I, I didn't have much. I wasn't, I'm not, I was not surprised, ultimately, that, uh, uh, of the outcome. In North Carolina. Um, we can talk more about that, but I think, I think one of the problems with the gerrymandering is that it means that if you live in Durham, Republican votes don't count. And if you're a rural Democrat, your vote doesn't count. And so it breeds a cynicism about the politics. And in fact, mm -hmm. that voter was absolutely correct. Our system is rigged. The solution is to is to you know, unrig it, mm -hmm. unrig it, <laughs> right, right, which, which is which is really which is really tricky to do, and and I want to ask about the personal and the, the political for for you, Deandra, because mm -hmm. um, when you're at an early point in your career as a scholar, um, you're told, put your head down, publish a lot, look really down, <laughs> right, down, down, right, look look really down. Um, get the work done, teach, don't take on controversial issues in the community, certainly, you know, that's definitely not, not useful. And yet, this might be an abnormal moment mm -hmm. with abnormal moral requirements. Mm -hmm. um, how do you navigate that? I mean, it's interesting because I think, well, I do think that organizations like Scholar Strategy Network really help us to do that sure. because shameless you know, plug absolutely. very much appreciated <laughs> absolutely anytime um, but I, I think that this is a very pivotal moment and I feel like it's one that we can't get wrong as a nation as a state mm. I think especially with young voters we're finding that in North Carolina we're seeing people between the ages of 18 and 25 are voting at declining rates over time and I, I deal with this with my students they come in they get the sense that the system is rigged they want to opt out but I think now something happened. I think it's post the 2016 election. I think it's post um, you know, the events in Charlottesville that not only are we paying greater attention to politics, but I think that people are fired up in a new way. And we're feeling like we don't have a choice but to get involved. Mm. I mean, this is the, the stake of our democracy is at stake. The health of our nation is at stake. And we as citizens, even if we're citizen scholars, have to jump in. And so I'm actually on a campaign committee for a mayoral candidate in Durham. And one of the coolest things that I think I've ever done was to participate in a local, um, a, a, it's called the, the, People, the People's Alliance PAC. And they basically endorse a candidate. And it's one of the most democratic things I've ever participated in. And it was really nice to see this gathering of over 400 people from the community come together and engage in really meaningful, open-minded, sometimes contentious mm -hmm. debate about various candidates, being willing to change their you know, preconceived alliances along the way. And I mean, to basically acknowledge that, you know, anybody with a tiki torch or a reality TV show can mm -hmm. get some power these days, um, but we can fight back, even if it's in the, that was a joke, everybody. Um, <laughs> stay in local. Always um, welcome. Stay in local, yeah. yeah. So, I'll try harder. <laughs> you're, 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 you're doing great. So I, I, I want to ask you, though, about the difference between Durham mm -hmm. and everywhere else, right? Because in some ways, and I want to ask you both about this, because in some ways, 
That's the problem everywhere, right? Which is that even if in Durham, sometimes, so Durham is the, the university town where Duke is, uh, but it's also a um, very, very diverse uh, uh, city with a very, very large African-American community. Even if a city like that is building these really interesting multiracial coalitions and politics across difference and whatever, it's one spot. And our politics is every spot gets some representation. Not every person, but every spot. Um, and so if one spot is doing fantastic, but five spots are doing poorly, even if they have fewer people, that's gonna be a real, a real problem. How do you bust out, whether you're busting out for multiracial democracy or whether you're busting out, as Gunther is, for progressive politics, period? Or is this stuff just contained to uh, the big cities of, of North Carolina? So I can answer that, that you're right. I mean, we have, a, in a way, what the, the success of Durham um, is offset. And can you say what that success is? Right, so let me back, back up. I mean, one thing we don't, it's easy to take for granted that North Carolina is a swing state. Back in 2000, it was not a swing state. 2004, some of the major urban counties in North Carolina, Mecklenburg, which is Charlotte, Wake County, which is Raleigh, voted for George W. Bush. Um, and Durham was already Democrat. Um, fast forward to the present, this is a success story in terms of progressive mobilization, largely through voter registration, uh, a massive expansion of voting rights took place in North Carolina, partly through the Obama wave, partly through the dedicated work of all kinds of organizations locally and nationally. And it grew the democracy. North Carolina went from, I think, 37th uh, in terms of a participation rate in 2000 to 8th in, in the election just passed. So it's a huge expansion of voting rights. And it's mostly seen in the cities. In the last election, Charlotte, which, which had been a George W. Bush in 2000, uh, and, and again in 2004, had a 32-point Hillary Clinton uh, bank. Uh, Wake County, Raleigh was over 20 points. Durham went from a 25-point Democratic plurality to a 60-point Democratic plurality. So there's this huge... Those are Philadelphia numbers. Yeah, no, I mean... Boston so numbers. Durham is uh, one point behind San Francisco County as a blue county. Uh, it's a 60-point margin. Right, San that's Francisco huge. numbers, yeah. okay. San Francisco is a little bit higher. <laughs> so uh, that's an... And that's a, not because of any demographic stuff. That's the way it often gets described. It's because of an organizing mobilization in a swing state where every single citizen was canvassed numerous times, had multiple chances to refuse to vote, people offering people rides, just networking of all kind. Now what happened in the last election is a cautionary tale, and I hope we can learn from it, mm -hmm. um, but in a nutshell, North Carolina, the Clinton campaign, unlike the Obama campaign, did not open, did not compete for rural votes. Did a great job in the cities. It left rural Democrats basically at home, um, you can see that in the data. There's a very clear Obama wave in rural counties. Rural Democrats did vote. They registered. They showed up in 2008, again in 2012. And Republican vote totals are pretty, pretty much flat. There's not a big Trump wave. Um, and so the opportunity is to figure out what we didn't do. I think she, the Clinton campaign had 27 field offices out of 100 counties. Obama had 90 out of 100. Um, so that was a strategic blunder. We can add that to the list of the reasons we could replay the, 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 the past. But I think the thing to learn is, is what does work in Durham can work elsewhere. It's about how people connect to neighbors, to local communities, um, how they will know the, the mayoral candidates, how they'll show up, they'll listen to each other, they will disagree. Um, what's happening in rural North Carolina is a more complicated story. But uh, one thing we, uh, above and beyond Clinton not, in effect, copying the Obama ground game, um, is we can't underestimate voter intimidation. Um, and, uh, and that brings us back to some of the things you've already talked about, about um, uh, the anti-immigrant rhetoric, but also the, anti, the clear attempt to, to keep poor, certain poor groups of people at home in the last election. You can drive through parts, uh, Eastern Carolina, you can drive on, on 64 East, which takes you to the beach, and these are majority black counties, majority Democratic counties, which saw their vote totals plummet in the last election. And you'll see signs for Trump, Pence, and Confederate flags, four or five of them, big signs, dominating the landscape. Mm -hmm. 
Not a single sign for Clinton. Um, and so that is, that's a kind of intimidation that is blatant. And uh, when you combine it with cutting back early voting, it mm -hmm. uh, means that it's much harder to get access has been cut back, plus the intimidation. Sure. So I, I, I want to ask you, Deandra, about, about the future. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to ask you two things. First, even before you talk about the future, I, I want you to tell me, I want to push you to a a ask, an, what is the most charitable way in which you can imagine what the GOP in North Carolina is doing? I, don't, I, wa I want to challenge for a moment the presumption, which I think is re reasonable and backed up by evidence, but I still want to challenge it, mm -hmm. that what they're doing is, is acting in a way to reduce the vote totals of their opponents. Mm -hmm. Is there something else that they could be doing? And if so, what is it? Maybe there isn't, but I, I know. It's a, it's a, I, I'm giving it a hard question. It's a hard right? question. And then the, the other question I want to ask you is, what comes next? How do we, what, where are things, where are things going to go? Mm -hmm. So, could so you there can start be an, with the tough an, one. an alternative explanation for what we're or seeing? Or is there? I mean, I'm an institutionalist. So for me, I feel like political institutions are where the battles are waged and where wars are won. And I think that- In places like the legislature. Oh, and yes. Like, I mean, how we draw district lines, electoral lines. I mean, I feel like that, that's done intentionally and it's strategic. And there's a reason why we see you know, the, the votes breaking down and the electoral outcomes breaking down. There's no accident. Do. I don't think it's accidental at all. Um, but of course, maybe I'm biased because I'm a scholar of institutions, um, but I use data and evidence. Um, but I think in terms of the future and where we're going, I, that's also tough. I do, so here's my hope. I feel like there's a silver lining in a lot of what we're seeing right now on the political landscape. And I think that, you know, Gunther and I have talked about this. There are multiple ways in which we might respond to some of the really troubling things that we're seeing in politics. And so, you know, we could be dejected and shut down and check out and say, the system is rigged, I'm just out. But I think on the other hand, it's so heartening to see people push back. And I think the future is people being fed up and feeling like, you know what, I have a civic duty to jump in and participate, to make my voice heard, and I think we're gonna see more of that in the future. That's my hope. Just to, and to follow up on that, one thing that you see very clearly as well, in places like Durham, activists are going outside of Durham, and they are, not to give a secret away, they've targeted the swing districts that are flippable, and they're organizing in a kind of what's called deep canvassing, recruiting one volunteer at a time through a kind of process of listening and building that volunteer army mm -hmm. to f turn the tables and flip the rug. And they're yeah. finding out some really interesting things as well about some of these uh, Republican districts. 80% of Wake County's Republican represented uh, districts support nonpartisan redistricting, yeah. 80%. Mm -hmm. They do not, this current Republican party, they're like the kids in a baseball game, they change the rules in the eighth inning. We're going to come and, back. And, We're going to come back to they're this. Not, they're not winning the argument, even with their own constituents. Right, but they might be winning the legislature. So well, that might be what counts. Yes. Yeah. So on, on that note, we're, we're in a moment going to go to a, our intermission. I just want to ask you all, if you do have a question on our first two sets of guests, write them down uh, during the intermission with the Q&A cards in your programs. Uh, and in Act 3, we'll come back uh, and talk about whether or not the little blue island of Massachusetts uh, really is so different from the rest of the ocean. Um, please thank Gunther Peck and Deandra Rose. I think you can walk up. You stayed. Great. I'm so glad. So welcome back for act three of the No Jargon Live show. So for everyone who turned their cell phones on during intermission, which would be 100% of you, um, please turn them back off or into airplane mode now.
So now we're going to talk about Massachusetts, uh, this little blue speck in a, what appears to be a sea of red. To do so, uh, we've got two great guests. Erin O'Brien is an associate professor of political science and chair of the department at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. She's also, uh, the, she's also former co-chair of the SSN chapter in Greater Boston. And she's a frequent commentator on WGBH and other places. And Peter Ubertasio is the uh, founding dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Stonehill College. And he's also frequently on TV and radio telling people what they need to know about Massachusetts politics. Please welcome them both. So I want to start things right off with stories. Tell me about this state in ways that help me understand it by telling me about a person or two who's important. Because from a distance, people just figure Massachusetts, liberal nirvana, or if they're conservative, Massachusetts, liberal hell. Right. So Post I think it's, it's more complicated. So. <laughs> Um, I'm actually going to surprise folks, I think, um, in picking somebody, folks aren't talking about that much. Jeff Deal. Some who, of you are who is that? I'm glad you asked. Uh, uh, Jeff <laughs> Deal is running, he has now announced that he's running against Elizabeth Warren for the Republican nomination. Uh, it doesn't look great for him, but I think it's important um, that it doesn't look bad for him. Um, in the Senate race. And so what I find so interesting about him is, as you did in the intro, and especially following North Carolina, that uh, people say that the Republican Party's not strong here, and certainly not a Tea Party, Donald Trump-esque Republican Party. That is Jeff Deal. Um, He's a Trumper. He is a Trumper. He worked for Trump. He was a campaign manager for Trump. And he has gained some traction. Now, he started his campaign saying, uh, I, like Elizabeth Warren, won't write a book. We weren't worried. Um, and it speaks to a certain anti-intellectualism that is starting to gain hold in Massachusetts. And I think it's striking that we tend to, I think in Massachusetts, a bit rest on our laurels. If you are someone who isn't happy with the turn in national politics, many in the state say, oh, we're different here. Well, we are different here, but uh, the, the Republican forces, I think it's important to watch what goes in that race, both from a gender politics perspective and from the perspective of the uh, more Trump forces gaining traction in Massachusetts, remembering that Donald Trump won the nomination, or Massachusetts voted for Donald Trump in the Republican primary. Jeff Geo. All right, so top <laughs> that. Peter. Well. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that if you're trying to figure out the peculiarities of this state, whether it's unique or not, you, you might say, you know, and you're, you're both too young, I'm sure, but if you were in Massachusetts in the early 1970s uh, and you left and you came back uh, today, uh, it looked pretty similar. You've got uh, a governor who, within the Republican Party, is, is fairly to the left, and you've got a legislature that is firmly Democratic, uh, has been for our entire lives, will be very likely for a very long time, uh, where there's still, within the Democratic Party, fairly conservative elements. So the, the state you know, is unusual in that regard. It hasn't changed much, if you're just looking at it face value. Uh, the, the names have changed. But one thing that I find very interesting uh, within the Democratic Party here and within the legislature is the Speaker of the House, Bob DeLeo. So he is an old school, you know, lunch bucket uh, Democrat. He is a, a person who strives to be you know, person of the House. He um, has a lot in common with someone like Tip O'Neill, who was also a former Speaker of the Massachusetts House. Very clappy on the back, big handshake, very, very friendly guy. Indeed, very, very much well-liked <laughs> within the legislature. It's not been true of some of his uh, immediate predecessors. But if you had said 30 or 40 years ago that Massachusetts would take the lead in uh, protecting transgender rights, and that the Democratic Speaker of the House would be supportive of that, that no one would believe you. Because the Democratic Party here had for a very long time been a fairly conservative element uh, in the state. The fact that it's a Democratic Speaker who actually took the lead and is on the front of that issue 
uh, demonstrates that the state has gone through a pretty significant shift. And so DeLeo, you know, who's often tagged as being the most conservative of the three leaders, and I think that that's in some ways accurate, uh, it's, a, it's a bit more complex than that. Well, let me ask you guys to tease out the difference between sort of social stuff, right, and <laughs> economic stuff, right? So, so in, in that way, so transgender rights now and gay marriage before are, are areas where Massachusetts has, has led the country. Um, now, not on all social policy, right. though, because, um, for example, uh, California, in response to um, Trump's talk on immigration uh, and his actions on immigration, became a sanctuary state you know, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts is still in this long debate Protracted. about whether or not to become a sanctuary state. It has some sanctuary cities. Um, these are cities that um, you know, do not cooperate, do not um, uh, search through their databases to um, work with uh, immigration uh, to, to flag undocumented immigrants. Um, Massachusetts is not that kind of, is not a sanctuary state yet, so it's not moving that way. And also Massachusetts is not um, necessarily on the forefront in terms of things like minimum wage, mm -hmm. paid family leave, um, all voter of that sort access. of thing. Voter access. Voter access. Mm -hmm. so, why isn't, given that this is the state of the Kennedys, this is the, this is the state of Elizabeth Warren and all of that, wh why doesn't the state have sort of uniformly progressive policies? I think it's because we're the state of the Kennedys in that the Democratic Party in Massachusetts in the modern era has never had a major party realignment. So what that means is the lunchbox, um, the sort of old school politicians still by and large run the Democratic Party. Now, have they shifted some? Yes, and Peter gives a really nice example. But if you recall, Massachusetts is only, we, we passed by like 70 or 80% in English only. Um, uh, I think it was 70%, and now it's in 2002. So you've got that more moderate force in the Democratic Party when parties realign, meaning they have to bring in new voters because it's really competitive, you know, that the Republicans are worried about being kicked out or losing the majority in the House or lo losing the majority in the Senate, usually they'll change their politics some. They'll bring in new voices. Massachusetts, ironically, has not had to do that. So what we have is good Democrats, no more, no less, right. like the Kennedys. <laughs> right. Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> Well, so uh, Donald Trump got about 40% of the vote in, in Massachusetts, and uh, that is absolutely consistent with all previous Republican nominees. He, he didn't do any worse, uh, he didn't do any better, it's, it's absolutely consistent. But those 40% of those voters who turn out, um, turn out disproportionately high numbers in local races. So, for example, you know, I, I know we're in the city, and we, maybe a lot of folks don't have, or go to town meeting, uh, if you had a town meeting, I happen to live in a, uh, what, classified, what we classify as a red town in Massachusetts. We have a Republican state representative. We have a Republican state senator. I know it must seem like you know, forever or, or some alternative universe for folks who live in, in greater Boston. They do exist. Mm -hmm. And the 40% the of those voters who turn out to support Donald Trump turn out in extraordinarily high numbers at town meeting. If you haven't been to one, you should go. Uh, there's really only one word that, that's operational there. It's no. And the folks who say no to any kind of improvement or reform turn out in very high numbers. And so uh, the Democrats <laughs> represent these areas as well. They know that these voters turn out in very high numbers in, in parts of the state that are outside of you know, Boston and Brookline and Cambridge. Um, and so they are attentive to that. And I think it does put the brakes on a lot of the kind of liberal reforms that you might like to see if you live in Northampton, you live in Cambridge, and you, you think, well, why is a democratic state not responding to these? Well, that's because it, the state is much more complex than that. So, in it, Mass it, Massachusetts please. is uh, abhorrently, I would argue, in the middle in terms of electing women and electing individuals of color. That means, in part, the Democratic Party hasn't sought out those candidates. Is it getting a little bitter? Yes, but we're still naming names of those. You know, Linda Dorsey-Nafori, who's a state senator. Anytime you're saying, isn't it great we have her? It means that she's new and it's somehow anomalistic. So it speaks to the Democratic Party's, I think, failure to go beyond good Democrats. Yes, good on some progressive issues, but not most, or not all, I should say. This strikes me as a real, real problem nationally too, right? That is, 
if a state like Massachusetts isn't, isn't dynamic, right? In, in some ways, there, there's a, a need, right, for, for any political party to make sure that its base areas are kind of contributing, right? So if you're running the Republican Party nationally, then you need Utah and Texas um, not just to be giving a lot of money, but to be out there on the edges of what is politically possible in terms of policy and blazing conservative um, agendas and testing new things and seeing if they, if they work. Um, it doesn't really strike me that for the, the Democrats, Massachusetts is kind of doing those things. I think that's fair to say. I also think if you're someone who wants national health care and wants gay marriage, you're a bit spoiled by living here. You know, in other maybe states, Massachuitz right? Massachusetts is doing right. those yeah, things. And so, it, I think it's. I think the best way to characterize it is a decidedly mixed bag. That good Democrats have become more liberal. They haven't necessarily, as a party, I mean, they haven't necessarily become uniformly or more progressive. So while Peter was talking, and he's correct, you know, that Massachusetts has been on the um, forefront of transgender rights and had a moderate Republican uh, governor eventually come around to that. When you look at economic policy, which you brought up earlier, you know, uh, we don't have our, our, the way we tax here isn't particularly progressive. And so I think uh, to understand Massachusetts politics is to say that, you know, you gave in the intro, I'm going to sell you out now. In the intro, that this blue state and a sea of red, I think uh, as someone who's not a native Massachusetts person and is new to studying or newish to studying Massachusetts politics, that provides a bit of a cover. And I think when you rip off that cover, you see that, that you, just like you said, we're not at the forefront of um, minimum wage. We're not at the forefront of progressive taxation. We're you know, um, 38th, 39th in terms of funding public higher ed. We're number one in funding you know, kindergarten. Uh, so we're like, yeah, isn't that great? But over here, we're not doing the other. So I, I think that's, that's the more complicated, though correct, narrative on Massachusetts. Aaron, let me ask you one, one follow-up question before we go to Peter, which is, so 2018 mm -hmm. could be a good year for Republicans in, in Massachusetts. Jeff Deal, mm -hmm. Governor Charlie Baker. You know, I'd love to say this. It sounds so cool. We were talking about this in the green room. Um, <laughs> Uh, boom. Um, but I, I, and what we were saying to steal what we were talking about, in part that Jeff Deal is actually really bad for Charlie Baker. Um, because Charlie Baker, rightly or wrongly, has carved out this space of, you know, I'm everyone's dad, <laughs> like the dad who like picked you up on time at the movies or whatever. Um, and on, <laughs> and then on the side, he is, you know, pushing economic policy that many, though not all, um, find pretty problematic, you know, in terms of moves to privatization and the like. Well, Jeff Deal is a Trump Republican. What that would mean is if Jeff Deal gets the nomination, which he has not yet, it means that Charlie Baker has to continually respond uh, and remind folks in Massachusetts that he's a Republican. And if you'll recall, Massachusetts is um, people party identify, identify first as Democrats, that's the biggest pool. The second is unenrolled, and the third is Republican. Unenrolled is, is no party. Right, yeah, sorry. And so I, I think it could be a good year. And I think Jeff Deal, as I already said, is a critical case, but I think he hurts Charlie Baker for re-election. And Charlie Baker has to run with Elizabeth Warren on the ticket this time. So Peter, I, I, I want to ask you about the Democratic Party then. You know, it, it strikes me as kind of being like a, like a glacier, right? <laughs> that is just sort of floating along, especially in the legislature. Um, and, and I don't understand why, if there's these town meetings, right, that all the, the party of no shows up again and again and again, um, why is it that the, Demo that, that the legislature is um, seven-eighths um, democratic, sort of, again and again and again? Well, there, there are a few reasons. One, uh, the Republican Party uh, historically in Massachusetts has been disorganized. They prefer to fight amongst themselves. Nobody cares. Uh, they care to argue with each other, but uh, they're, they're, they have historically not been the kind of party that does a lot of significant outreach, and Democrats have been very good at that. Uh, they put all of their resources in, in successful gubernatorial candidates, so Frank Sargent, Bill Weld, uh, Mitt Romney, you know, Charlie Baker, that they put everything they have there, and they do not attend to the rest. Now, 
partly they don't attend to the rest because they've had no success there, and you know they don't you don't like to lose your money on, on things that are not going to you know pay any kind of but but you might dividend. you might not mind losing your money if your amount of money is infinite. Um, I, <laughs> Right. I would what, love to meet and, your banker. Right, and, well, or, or, near, or nearly infinite. And, and what I mean by that, and what I want to ask is, are things shifting at all with um, the Koch network and sort of the nationalization of far-right politics? I mean, have they started to put, you know, conservative infrastructure fighting in every district kind of money into Massachusetts? They have. So there are plenty of uh, what our colleague Mo Cunningham has been uh, really dogged on, on looking at uh, dark money organizations in the state that have been funneling this money to um, conservative candidates. Um, they have yet nothing to show for in terms of electoral viability. So they, they, they are, the money is out there. Uh, maybe you get you know, leaflets in the mail uh, attacking your incumbent state legislator. They are nonprofit, nonpartisan organizations that always go after uh, Democrats. Um, and they have certain members of the legislature running scared, but mm -hmm. they haven't won anything. Uh, they've been defeated almost every, at, at every stop. So, you know, I think, I think there is that possibility, but um, I would just disagree slightly with the way you intro this piece. 2018 is not going to be a good year for the Republican Party in Massachusetts. I mean, there is, there, it is hard to imagine a worse possible set of circumstances when... when and those circumstances are, are, can be described as... Donald Trump yes. is president. Indeed, indeed. I mean, he, you know, he, he, he is historically unpopular here. Um, if Jeff Deal wins the nomination for the Senate, Jeff Deal would love to have Donald Trump here. And I'm sure Elizabeth Warren would love to have Donald Trump come and campaign for her, her opponent. Um, the, the governor may do well, but, you know, only really by divorcing himself from his own party because, you know, the, the brand is not going to benefit him. Um, so there, there is an element of that. that one reason, to go back to your, your point, though, I mean, Democrat, it's, it's awfully hard to be an incumbent legislator. And Democrats have controlled the legislature for so long. Uh, there's a lot of longevity here. If you mm -hmm. want to leave the legislature, you, you, it's, or if you leave the legislature, it's not likely it's been because of a defeat. And right. so it's, it's, you know, they, they have a grip. And if you're young and you're politically aggressive in Massachusetts and you want to get ahead, even if you're conservative, which party are you going to gravitate to? The party that actually elects people at all levels, or, or the party that likes to fight? You know, Democrats like to fight amongst it's themselves, too. Like the, it's the kind of like the double right. hack uh, effect, right? So you could imagine that um, you've got, uh, in each party, you've got some activists, and you've kind of got some hacks, people who <laughs> uh, just want to be in politics, but whatever, they don't really care. And in an ordinary state with comp co competitive politics, the the kind of hacks, right, would, would just randomly go to both parties evenly. But in Massachusetts, any hack with a brain is going to join the Massachusetts party, but the Democratic party, because it's the one with more jobs, <laughs> right? It's the one with more chance to get ahead most of the time. And so the Massachusetts party, like the, the glacier gets heavier and more centrist because of the, this is my, this is my pop political theory. This is why I'm not a political scientist myself. <laughs> right? um, can, so that's my theory. Does it stand, hold any water whatsoever? Oh. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> not, not for publication, you know, I, but my, in lived my, experience. My Republican students hypothesis. are waiting for me to answer. <laughs> they say if they join the Republican Party, they're a hack with no brain. I probably wouldn't go that far. I mean, there, there are <laughs> plenty of young conservatives who would like to refashion the Massachusetts Republican Party. They don't have any patience for someone like Donald Trump. Um, Right, right. Now, and I'm, I'm saying that the activists who are conservative would stay with the Republican Party. Sure. But it's actually that the, the less talented, more centristy, whatever, you know, wish you, people who don't care so much about what politics they're in, but really want a job, but actually, those I, are going to float to the Democratic Party. I'd like to go back to your original question, which was, you know, are Republicans investing in Massachusetts? Um, hacker activist, <laughs> but Doesn't are matter. they? No. We, we do know from you know, the research, some of which was you know, on the uh, stage during Act One, that Republicans are more likely to play the long game. And if we assume near infinite money, as you, as you did, and I think that's a fair assumption, if we assume that all Republicans have to do is play a long game here. You know, any victory is a big victory in Massachusetts, especially symbolically. Um, you know, look what happened when Scott Brown won. Um, it, you know, that, that really, I mean, it got rid of single payer uh, on the national the health public, care. The public option. And it be, yeah, thank you. Um, and it, it became uh, a big talking point for Republicans. 
So um, historically, especially in the last 20, 30 years, we have seen the Democratic Party does not play the long game. The Republican Party does. And if that is borne out, we're starting to see some of that in Massachusetts with the funding levels. And I think that's something important to watch for because Peter is right. The Republican Party has not been good at organizing uh, to win office in Massachusetts. But if money starts filtering in and they start to build an infrastructure, 40% turned out for Trump. You know, that's not, a, a, a Scott Brown has won. Elizabeth Warren didn't win by huge numbers. And so yes, it is fair to say a solid blue delegation in Massachusetts, but it's not a solid blue state. So that, that leads me to a question about money, money in politics. So there was recently, and this is my, my last question, all over the globe the last day or two, um, there's been um, this big settlement um, that the, uh, the people who are fighting in favor of this charter school ballot initiative um, had to pay a half a million dollars because um, of hiding who their donors was and that sort of thing. Um, can I, either of you tell us just a little bit about sort of what happened and, and what does that say about where we're going in terms of you know, the, all this dark, dark and secret money? Well, uh, they didn't have to pay that fine because they concealed their donors. You're allowed to conceal your donors. Uh, they had to pay the fine. Oh, great. They were engaging in, in political activities, and they're not supposed to do that as a nonpartisan organization. So they clearly crossed that threshold, and um, they've been fined, the largest such fine in, in the state's history. Our colleague, uh, Mo Cunningham uh, from UMass Boston, has been writing about this for quite a while. He's been really dogged in his pursuit of trying to unmask these, these dark money organizations, uh, I, it's, it's a really important moment because it, it, it suggests, as Mo told the Boston Globe, I'm gonna paraphrase him, that you know, we as citizens have a right to know who's trying to you know, chase our vote or change our vote. And uh, by ha they, they were forced to unmask their donors, and it turns out some of the donors have uh, senior uh, positions in the Baker administration. And uh, this is it's going to be a really interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds. You know, Charlie Baker, uh, the governor, is is really well liked, but but people like Charlie Baker and and don't listen to him at the same time because he was advocating uh, positions on ballot initiatives last year that went down to pretty significant defeat, despite all of the dark money that was flowing into the state. And now, you know, one year later, you have that that particular organization, and I'm going to blank on the name of it. But it's something great, like Families for School. I mean, right. something and like kids. that. Right. 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 That's not the name, but. Um, right. Families being for America. Unmasked, right. right. And so, so you're getting a peek inside uh, how, how those dark money organizations work. And uh, I think that that's going to continue to be an issue in the state because um, they're ramping up for, for more ballot initiatives. So we're going to see a lot more of that kind of money flowing through the state. And it's a potentially very interesting test case for the other states. Um, you know, it has some new ground been broken with this decision as we head into 18. Yeah, dark money is super, super scary. We're going to talk about it some, we're going to talk about it some more. First, if you'd all uh, give a big round of applause to Peter and Aaron. <laughs> I don't need this card. I don't need that card. I don't need this card. Okay. So, uh, now is your last chance to write down a question, uh, if you have one, for Aaron and for Peter. In a moment, we'll bring our other guests back to the table. Uh, I just wanted to tell you first some of the things, or two of the things, or sorry, three of the things <laughs> that the Scholar Strategy Network uh, is, is up to when we're not busy uh, putting out this wildly fantastic podcast. So. <laughs> The, the, first is just, the first is just a teaser, uh, which is to say that, so Massachusetts is having a debate uh, in, the, in the weeks and months to come about whether or not to raise the minimum wage in this state to $15 an hour. And as part of that debate, there's the question of whether or not it would be good for people and families uh, and the economy of the state. As part of that debate, we've been helping economists, um, most notably, um, UMass Boston economist uh, Arthur McEwen, who's here someplace in the audience, uh, to think about how to write um, and how to organize other scholars uh, to effectively communicate about what that minimum wage increase could mean for families in this state. Uh, so he's been in touch with help from our team uh, at the Scholar Strategy Network staff uh, with dozens 
of other economists in this state. And if you watch your newspapers, I think next week, uh, you may see what I think will be a pretty important statement from them. Secondly, uh, I wanted to say that even today, uh, while we are here, the Trump administration has been very, very busy. Uh, and it's been busy in New Hampshire talking about elections. And what it's talking about uh, is whether or not people who have uh, a driver's license from out of the state of New Hampshire uh, but are registered to vote in New Hampshire um, are fraudulent people who do not exist or who are being bussed in to steal the elections in those states, um, or whether or not they might just be, for example, students who live at the University of New Hampshire and got their license when they were 16 and didn't choose to pay for a new New Hampshire license because perhaps they didn't want to spend the money. Um, so we have been helping political scientists around the country respond to this debate because the questions, the facts, the evidence um, about our elections really matter as to whether or not um, there'll be changes, more changes in the voting laws of many, many states. Uh, and we're helping them have quiet conversations with journalists all around the country so that they can uh, unpack the spin and the hype and the misinformation uh, in order to make sure that the most fundamental rights of Americans are protected. The last thing that the Scholar Strategy Network uh, is doing right now is growing. We are growing very, very quickly uh, at this stage, and we are really focused on having scholars, researchers in many, many communities around the country have uh, an impact on their cities, their towns, their states, and through those states on the whole country. Uh, and I just want to thank you guys, our listeners and our supporters, for helping this network grow. So with that, um, if you had any final questions, you can pass them to the aisles now, and then uh, there'll be SSN staff to grab those questions and pass them in. And I would like to ask back on the stage our previous guests, Theta Scotchpole, Renee Flores, Gunther Peck, and DeAndra Rose. I think they're coming from both sides. <laughs> Oh, I'm really excited. I have a whole new set of cards. Okay, great. <laughs> Welcome back. So, so my first question is for Renee. Why is Trump sympathizing with dreamers? You know, he just got rid of, he said he was going to get rid of phase out, deferred action for childhood arrival immigrants. But then he said, oh, they have nothing to worry about. My heart goes out to dreamers, all of that sort of thing. Why is he sympathizing with dreamers when he's been so anti-immigrant in his rhetoric? Well, that's a great question. I mean, it could actually be some kind of Machiavellian move, if you want to put it that way. Right now, within the immigrant community, there's a lot of uh, nervousness uh, because they are afraid that this uh, issue with dreamers, essentially what happened was that they said DACA was going to expire within six months. Essentially putting a ticking bomb, you know, like a time bomb on this particular population. So what the immigrant, immigrant advocates are afraid of is that it could divide up the movement by basically uh, forcing Democrats to, to surrender to whatever demands coming from the conservatives to say, yes, we want to save dreamers. We'll, we'll, you know, we're willing to do whatever it takes to, to save these very sympathetic, hardworking hard Americans from being deported, and we're going to agree with whatever conservative policies you're going to put forward. For example, it could be building the wall. It could be, um, you know, making a lot more punitive measures against immigrants. So, I mean, we, there's a lot of different immigrant groups that are, have a lot, a lot less protection than dreamers, including dreamers' own parents. So, so, or, or, or immigrants, for example, that are here uh, because they're fleeing some kind of disaster. A lot of Central American Salvadorans are under, uh, Haitians are under this uh, situation. So in a certain sense, Trump could be uh, putting pressure on liberal uh, congressmen by saying, listen, you want to save uh, you know, the dreamers, you're going to have to sacrifice all of the other, all the other immigrants and it's a way to, so, so that could, that's one way that immigrant advocates are actually very afraid of doing that. So it doesn't signal necessarily that Trump is pro-immigrant, but that they could be playing this kind of a, like longer, longer term. Right. You, you, can have, you can have the dreamers and no one else. And, and you're going to pay these costs. And, and you have six months to do it, so there's a lot of pressure right now on, on, on the liberal congressman to act. Sure. Tita? Um, I don't question that advocates are scared that way, but they should calm down. 
I don't think there's any evidence that the pressure is really on Democrats right now. Democrats do not control what comes up in Congress. And they are not, most of them, going to make the kinds of deals that are being proposed here. The pressure is on the Republican Party. And, you know, Trump read in the newspaper that Americans like dreamers. So but he, he didn't read it. He saw it on a screen. Yeah. So, a, so he a tweets out from that cartoons. he loves dreamers. It's not complicated and it's not Machiavellian, but it puts the Republican Party in a really bad position because this issue divides them. I don't know whether anything's going to come out of the Congress, but it's not going to be because of Democrats. And so it would be a big mistake, in my view, for immigrant, pro immigrant activist groups to to target Democrats right now. The, right. the focus so, uh, needs uh, to be on the people who actually can control what comes up and what goes into the legislation. So I want to switch, I want to switch for a second and go back to elections, because we, uh, we have a bunch of questions to, to move through as, as much as we can. And I want to bring up for Gunther and Deandra um, a word that hasn't come up at all tonight, which is Russia. So here's the, <laughs> the question. Oh, it's kind of an important glad. word. Well, here's, here's the question. <laughs> So Keaton Brower, uh, who's from a, a, a native North Carolinian, born in Winston-Salem, asks this. Even if voters wake up, I am worried that Russian active measures will affect the 2018 elections as they did in 2016. How do we engage with voters, uh, especially voters who are uh, less educated about relevant issues, perhaps, um, uh, to deal with fake news? Um, especially when fake news is distributed really strategically via social media, and when there's you know a foreign power that wants one side to win. <laughs> you can go first, or I can go. Good luck. Um, well, I think it, there's a way in which I have a skepticism about about the Russian interference, not because I don't think it may have existed, but I think it distracts from the things we can that. Uh, we need to face as progressives to figure out how to mobilize better, I would call it the latent democratic majority that is the United States. And uh, Russia could play a role in that, I suppose. But this comes quite close to home in Durham County. There was a recent news report by Michael Wines in the New York Times that there apparently may be some evidence that there was a, some hacking in several key precincts in Durham County on election day. And I was at one of those precincts at NC Central, where most people had already voted, but Which is a, a historically, a historically black, black college. college that had not turned out in the election leading up to this month. So there was going to be a tremendous pent up demand on election day. And the electronic data system failed. So they had to switch to paper ballots and paper verification, which is actually a good uh, mechanism, but it slows the whole process down uh, so that so much so that by one in the afternoon we had a four hour wait on the line uh, and the line melted. We lost several hundred voters who had to go to work. Uh, and so the question then becomes how does, to me, the question is how does that, whether if that was true, uh, it could happen again. There were several other precincts that this happened to across the state. Um, if that is the likely. case, it's a bigger threat. Uh, we have to figure out a way to educate ourselves as voters. So we're actually having a, going to have a public forum at Central uh, in a few weeks to hear election day stories and to figure out how we can, if all of those good students had voted early, that wouldn't have been a problem. So I think voting early, there are ways in which we can be more vigilant as citizens to preempt the kind of potential threat that Russia would have. But it is a real threat. It's an existential mm -hmm. threat. And I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to it, but I think, except to organize and to educate, mm -hmm. that's, that's all I can say. I would echo to say education is extremely important, especially on the fake news uh, point. Mm. I think that whatever we can do to help people to distinguish between actual news and fake news and to understand um, like the, the trustworthiness of various sources. And at Duke, for example, some of our colleagues and I are working on modules to, to, and ho to hopefully increase um, civic education, so to provide some sort of public service in helping to explain a lot of things that I think people are mystified by when it comes to 
becoming involved as citizens. So anything we can do on that front to help educate and to bring people into um, civic and political activism. So from, from that question about a way in which politics in 2016 was really different and abnormal, I, I want to ask you, Theda, a question about whether or not um, what's been happening in, in politics um, is part of just a, an ordinary pendulum swing. So this question comes from Paul Lyons, and it's, and it's this. Um, it, can you explain how and why um, so many state legislative seats and governorships across the nation switched from Democrats to Republicans over the course of the Obama administration? And I just want to add to that, you know, there was a, a Vox article um, around the time of the election that said, there's nothing wrong with the Democratic Party that losing the presidency wouldn't fix. <laughs> Well, it is true that during the Obama years, but I think this started to some degree before that, um, but especially during the Obama years, um, Democrats and liberals stopped placing the emphasis on organizing for state and local elections. And at the same time, the election of Obama clearly had a mobilizing impact <laughs> on both the free market elite right and the um, uh, the populist, uh, culturally anxious uh, right, the two prongs that I discussed before. Um, now, it is a pattern in American politics that when this conjuncture of one president backed by their party appears, the other side mobilizes. But I don't like the pendulum uh, imagery because it, it creates the assumption of something natural that's going to happen without human intervention. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that the right in this country, both the populist and the elite right, organized to death, you know, after, before and after Obama came to office, but particularly during the Obama presidency. And they organized across the states. They have a remarkable capacity to set agendas, mobilize people in between as well as during elections, and to create kind of a continuous engagement. Uh, for their base that then they fall back on and win midterm elections when Democrats tend to stay home. So there are no shortcuts here, basically, and there, there aren't even any protest shortcuts. I mean, there are some people on the left who think that getting on the cameras, because carrying signs, is, is enough. Right. Well, and it's not enough, and it's not, it wasn't enough for the Tea Party on the right, they did more than that. They did that, but they also met, and they organized, and they voted, and they contacted their legislators, and they did it in a very unglamorous way at state and local levels and Congress, as well as the presidency. Well, I, I, I want to ask you, Aaron, a follow-up question on that, which is that, so there's, there's a, a kind of more uh, optimistic view that comes from Lou in the audience. Um, it's for, for everyone, but I want to ask you this, which is, which is this. If you picture a map of the United States, if only um, millennials had voted in 2016, um, you know, it would have just, Clinton would have, Hillary Clinton would have won over 90% of electoral districts. Um, so therefore, do you think that a big swing to uh, elections over time to liberals, the liberals and left? The die solution. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the let them die solution is the inevitable. You like. with gerrymandering. And we call it generational replacement, <laughs> but... <laughs> right, right, yeah. oh, uh, I mean, I, it, it, be more serious. It, it, a, most millennials didn't vote. So, you know, part yeah. of that idea, and, and, and it's a very fair question, but part of the idea there is that they're turning out, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the minority of millennials that did turn out did go for the Democratic right. Party. Um, but I think it speaks to part of what um, uh, Theta was saying in that that assumes it, that that forward trajectory of it's inevitable for the Democrats is devoid of politics. Um, you know, those millennials can be convinced or with education or with fake news to um, change their party affiliation. Or stay home. Right, exactly. So, uh, you know, I think it, 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 there is hope in that. I, Lou, I'm with you on that. But I also think that that's not enough because politics will intervene. We, it is true over the life course, people sometimes do come 
more conservative, but it's also, we're gonna have all these intervening variables of different parties, or probably the same parties, but acting in different ways. We're gonna have different economic conditions. Uh, who knows what else comes up as intervening variables on those current millennials. And, and, and so is it, it the it, case that the... I think it's just important the Democratic Party can't rest on that. Right. Because the Democratic Party, as you'll recall, we were going to win. We, I shouldn't, it's a podcast. No one, my people at work won't hear. They hear you. Uh, okay. they, hear no, you. they will have 10,000, they will hear. But what I meant, the you, Dem you, with, you with your citizen hat. Yes, exactly. The, 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 the thank you. Good save. Um, the, 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 the Democratic Party said demographics were going to save us this time. And it, that didn't turn out because politics intervened. And I think um, when we look at the, the positive news, to my mind, from a citizen perspective, in that millennial numbers, politics will also intervene there. And Demo uh, Republicans have been better at organizing to change those minds. Right, and if I could just add to add really quick. I mean, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that uh, one of the primary reasons why millennials tend to be more liberal it's not necessarily because they have this more you know, enlightened, but that's like revealing my own preferences, right? Not because they're more open-minded necessarily, but because they're, because they're more racially and ethnically diverse. We have to remember that Trump carried the white millennial vote. And when you look, there's actually some research coming out of the University of Chicago that you look at how white millennials think, they're actually more, more aligned to how the rest of the white population think. 60% uh, of them think that white people are being discriminated against and we need to, to remedy that. But it's really the diversity within this millennial population that is actually making the group seem more progressive. So within the white population, there's a lot more work that needs to be done, even within this youngest cohort. Just wanted to throw that out there. Well, th that brings me actually to the role of, of organizing, right? So Erin, um, you were mentioning um, the, that there's all these different things that could happen, right, that will affect uh, the elections in the years, years to come, and we don't know what they're all going to be. But one that we do know, right, is the, the strength or weaknesses or, of organizations will make a really big difference. Um, can you tell me uh, now about the strength of organizations on the left, but also on the right, as you see them in, in, in North Carolina? And maybe, Deandre, you want to start, and then, Gunther, you can add in whatever you think. I mean, I think that's a great question. I mean, from my vantage point, it varies. So for young people, for example, I mean, my students are involved in a lot of groups. They feel like they belong to certain things, but I don't know that they go to meetings the way that older generations might have. So, you know, they're not in with the Kiwanis organization. Uh, for example. No, actually, I've, I've said that once in class, and I have a student who raised a hand and was like, actually, I am a Kiwanis. I'm an 18-year-old Kiwanis yes. member. Oh, uh, wow. Or, or okay. like your grandfather. And so um, I, I, I do think that having some um, increasing opportunities for people to become involved and facilitating that involvement, reaching out to people. I mean, we know that people tend to get involved in politics when they're asked. So mm -hmm. I think that mobilization efforts is the first step here. I would, well, two things. I think young people's political engagement is um, a key question to raise about how it, how, it, how it gets organized and when. And I think, you know, we're seeing a kind of turn against this, this model of civic engagement. There's nothing wrong with civic engagement or social entrepreneurship. Like volunteering and Volunteering stuff. And, and, you know, in effect, many of the kind of heroic pedagogies that some of my colleagues describe and articulate bypass politics altogether. Mm -hmm. And they kind of centralize the individual subject who's going to s figure out how to, mm -hmm. you know, bring humanitarian aid to this mm -hmm. refugee camp or whatever, ignoring mm -hmm. U.S. immigration policy, for example, mm -hmm. um, which might be causing human trafficking to uh, bloom around the world. So there's ways in which I think this current generation is actually more sophisticated but less connected in terms of organizations. That said, I think actually at the local level, the misleading picture we would give is that North Carolina is actually incredibly, it's almost awash in organizations. There's right. like, there, there are dozens of grassroots organizations that are doing unbelievable work. Mm -hmm. The problem is, if I had to give one problem that I would change, if I could have one wish list, it would be that when the presidential politics come around every four years, that they don't impose a top-down big data model that by and large ignores and separates off the wisdom of people at the local level. And so one of the reasons to explain why Obama didn't create 
exchange in, in state houses is because OFA and all that Obama energy, an unbelievable volunteer movement. We had 11,000 volunteers in Durham County out of 103,000 who voted for him. One out of 10 citizens volunteered for this man in our election. And local democratic organization got nothing from it mm -hmm. because the OFA kept it all to themselves. They didn't pass on that knowledge to the next group. And then they left town. And then the <coughs> next group came in four years later. Big data, the sort of fetish that uh, Mr. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Mook uh, is involved with. I understand where it comes from, but it's actually missing some of the ways in which politics is best organized, which is local and combining it with big bigger organization. That's a long-winded answer. But you need to have both. I, I can see, you know, for, for, for liberals li listening, right, I can, I, I can certainly see, right, and I, I feel uh, personally, right, some of the fears involved in the, the Trump administration and, and the, some of the policies that are, that are promised. But I worry, and this question comes, is going to come to you, Peter, but then broader, um, is whether or not money in politics, right, and whether or not um, a changing country um, and currents in our politics now are just basically ripping the nation in, in half, right? So you have activists on both sides who move their money and who aggregate their money in large amounts, not just the hyper-wealthy ones, but definitely the hyper-wealthy ones, and they build entire schools of thought and schools of mobilization from the top to the bottom, right, to really mobilize people year after year after year and to fight Right? And that fight is coming, I think, to Massachusetts, too. Right? How, isn't that dangerous for the entire country, right? Even regardless of Trump and the, the moment, right? It's just dangerous that we'll just rip each other sort of to shreds? Well, sure. I mean, that is, that is <laughs> that's dangerous. That's not dangerous, really. I don't want uh, people engaging in violent behavior in that way. Um, look, you said, is it coming to Massachusetts? It, well, it's, it's come here. And it was turned back into uh, ballot initiatives last year, or one in particular, um, you know, which the, one? The charter school initiative, uh, where lots of big money came in and tried to, you know, basically move the state in a direction where it wasn't ready to go, and they were, they were stopped. And so, you know, they were stopped by uh, teachers' unions, uh, advocates for public schools. Um, there is a way to do that, and, you know, and I think Massachusetts might actually offer a model for how you can uh, attempt politically to fight back against that tide. You know, and as I say, you know, if you, in before that election, you had this incredibly popular Republican governor who was taking the lead in this ballot initiative, and and it lost by a pretty substantial amount. It was a, it was one of the few times where I think Governor Baker seriously misstepped. Um, now it hasn't affected his. Popularity. He's still enormously popular, uh, but it does demonstrate that there are limits and that you can push back against that. You can push back against that money. They, they, sometimes we assume that, well, because they have that amount of money, that it's impossible. Uh, but we have seen in Massachusetts, I said it a moment ago, the Mass Fiscal Alliance is another one of these dark money organizations, just pours money, uh, but they're really poor at organizing. They're not very good at it. And then, and then they, they think, well, I've got all this money, so they spend it in ways that's not terribly effective. Um, they cross the bounds of decency. People respond to that, and they push back. And so we haven't, you know, I, it will happen again and again. It will happen in 2018, surely, in Massachusetts. We're going to see a lot more money uh, coming into the state. But I, I think that, that we offer a, a perhaps more positive take. And I don't mean to minimize sure. the degree of danger that exists in the country at this moment, but uh, that may not be the only the only way to frame it. Right, right. So with that, I want, I want to go to my very last question of the night. And before I do, I have a couple of, of thank yous uh, that I, I just want to, want to make. I want to thank the Calderwood Pavilion, uh, and I want to thank Cambridge Community Television, who's created the video for tonight's event. You can rewatch it again and again and again to relive <laughs> the happy moments uh, 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 of tonight. Um, I want to thank our sound engineer, uh, J.M. Byes, and I want to thank the producers of our show, Shira Rasco and Dominic Dumas. And yeah, well, we can give them some applause. Uh, and I want to thank the steering committee, the staff, uh, the funders of the Scholar Strategy Network, and especially our members. Uh, without them, 
especially you, uh, not just this show, but the entire organization could not exist. Um, and lastly, I want to thank our guests, Theda, Renee, Deandra, Aaron, and Peter. Please. <laughs> After the show, our guests and everyone will be in the lobby, so please uh, take it if you want to, if you had one last question, that's your, that's your moment. And this is my last question. And I'd actually like you all to answer it, but not tonight. You can email me, <laughs> right? You can email me those answers and I'll post them on our website. And so for those of you who want to read them later, we'll send it out and you can check it out at scholars.org. So the question goes to Theta and it's this. Given everything we've heard tonight, you know, we're, we're at a time when, when research and evidence and facts sometimes don't seem to matter to our politics at all. Uh, and our democracy itself, like in North Carolina, seems to be sometimes at, at real risk. What can individual people do? Well, all by themselves, it's hard. But you know, uh, um, uh, getting together with others uh, can make a difference. Now. We we're seeing citizens doing that across the country um, and very creatively in ways that go well beyond any advocacy group or national advocacy group or political party, uh, coming up with uh, ways to gather facts and, and mount uh, um, public events or contact their representatives. Um, you know, I think for those of us who are university-based, and that's a lot of people here, not everybody, the Scholar Strategy Network does make a difference because we work together. I mean, right after the election, more than a third of our then, I think it was 700 and some members, got in touch to say, what can we do? And uh, we got together to talk about how we could pull facts together about what's happening. Those facts do matter when they're not just presented to fellow scholars or academics in insider language, but are translated into everyday um, English uh, so that we can talk with our fellow citizens, with the media, with uh, policymakers. And, uh, you know, the Scholar Strategy Network, a lot of the discussion tonight has been people cro crossing the boundary between their scholarship and their citizen preferences. And in the Scholar Strategy Network, which is now close to 1,000 people, we're getting, we're getting close. And you have to do something to join. You don't just, you have to produce something to join. So it's not just one of these things where you get on a mailing list. Um, the Scholar Strategy Network uh, includes people of many political persuasions. And I want to stress that because we have highly valued members who are not who would not characterize themselves as progressives or liberals. I don't know that because we ask, we don't. I just sort of heard it. <laughs> and and we it. enable all of our members, either individually or collectively, to share their research, their findings, their reasoned arguments, respectfully but clearly presented with the full range of public audiences. Uh, that goes for those who are not liberal, as well as those who are, and in many areas, people disagree on policy solutions. But there are a lot of people in the Scholar Strategy Network who are very concerned about the direction that American governance and politics has taken in this period, and we enable them to work together to use evidence and reason-based arguments to influence agendas of discussion and legislation uh, and to promote a fair and inclusive democracy. I personally do not consider those basics to be partisan. I think they're basic to what makes Western liberal societies and all freedom-loving societies work. And so. Contact your friends. If you haven't already joined, join the Scholar Strategy Network because we can do things better together than we can do them separately. And we're organized now in, what, 27 chapters. 
We've got members and chapters in dozens and dozens of states. It's not just California and Massachusetts. <laughs> it's everywhere. Um, and that really can make a difference over time in the way ev American citizens understand the public issues that we all have to face together. Well, I couldn't have said it any better than that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us, and good night.